we're in Geneva, which is the first major motor show of the year and one of the most glittering. It's always been something of a mystery how it is that Switzerland, which has of course virtually no automotive industry of its own, should find itself the host of one of the most influential motor shows in the international calendar, but that's how it is. Once again this year, many of the major manufacturers, including mighty Mercedes, have chosen Geneva to launch important new cars onto the marketplace. Sue Baker is here with me. We'll be trying to give you at least a glimpse of most of the new cars on offer here. Indeed, let's go over to Sue straight away on the Citroen stand. This is one of the most significant new cars in the show, a fresh rival for the Ford Escort. It's Citroen's new ZX, and it's going to be offered in a range of engine sizes from 1.4 litres to 1.9 injection. It slots into the Citroen range between the little AX and the bigger BX, and it follows the recent Citroen trend towards more conventional body styling. Inside, pretty conventional too, but there are more surprises around the back. Now this is a pretty big boot for the size of car and you might think that's not going to leave much knee room in the back seat and you'd be right. It's a very tight squeeze in here, at least it is, until I slide the seat back. And there's also adjustment for the rake. Now those are features the rivals would do well to copy. For multi-purpose vehicle lovers, Renault have got a new Espace on display to fend off the attack on their lead position that's now coming from all directions. The overall look is very much the same, although they've softened and rounded the outline. But they've completely redesigned the interior. The front and middle seats now swivel and turn to increase the already very flexible use of space. In the UK in June, they say, and with no price increases. Now to Honda and the new legend. The car designed to carry their attack deep into BMW and Jaguar country carries the old name, but it's been totally redesigned from bumper to bumper, longer, lower, infinitely handsomer than the current model comes in two-door and four-door versions, both with an extra long 114-inch wheelbase to give lots of legroom inside, an all-new 3.2-litre V6 engine, and a cracking standard equipment list that includes, for example, a keyless high-security locking system, and for the very first time a stand in the UK, a safety airbag system. Now, given Honda's very high build quality, I'm sure BMW spies will be crawling all over these two cars. This car has a hard act to follow. The old BMW 3 Series was highly successful, and the new one keeps the same proven formula. Still rear-wheel drive, and it has a similar range of engines, from 1.8 to 2.5 litres. It's slightly longer, taller, and wider than the old one, with better aerodynamics, and a new rear suspension. The weight distribution has been improved with a much more even balance between front and rear, which has helped achieve better road holding, and that's an area in which the old 3 Series was sometimes criticised. The new one goes on sale in Britain next month. Anyone drawing up a short list of the best cars in the world would just have to include this one. It's Mercedes' new S-Class, and it certainly sets fresh standards in luxury car motoring. It's an amazingly opulent car, all sorts of electronic gadgetry. The seat belts automatically adjust themselves to your shoulder height. All four seats have memory devices. It comes with a range of engines up to a new 6-litre V12, which propels this two-ton motor car at over 150 miles an hour. Now, Mercedes have always been good at insulating their car, but they've gone a stage further with this. The windows are double glazed. There are two layers of glass with a 3mm gap in between, and that has obvious advantages in cutting down heat loss, in reducing noise, and also in stopping the car misting up in the winter. Now, if you're one of those people who has ever complained late at night of the neighbours returning home and slamming their car doors, you'll wish they had one of these. Because this car, if you just push the doors too, they automatically close themselves. Mercedes have always been at the forefront of luxury car design, and this car is clearly aimed at keeping them there. But the European manufacturers face increasing competition from the Japanese, with cars like Toyota's Lexus muscling in. Well, now the Japanese are trying harder in the executive car market as well. And Mitsubishi's new Sigma is priced directly to compete with BMW's 5 Series. Jeremy Clarkson has been trying out the Sigma in the Alps. Well, Toyota have laid on this little exhibition. They themselves describe it as something a little different. They're being modest. It's a totally off-the-wall display of lateral thinking. All these vehicles were designed and built by Toyota employees as part of a competition they run each year for their in-house engineering association. They get a fantastic response and these are the prize winners. It opens up, I think, a whole new window of that inscrutable Japanese psyche. Is this perhaps the hidden engine of their inventiveness?
something a bit more down to earth. Coupes have been making quite a comeback recently, and this is the newest of them, Mazda's MX-3. It's a sporty little 2 plus 2 that aims to steal away some of the drivers currently zipping around in Volkswagen Corrados and Honda CRXs. Now there are going to be two versions, a 1.6 four-cylinder automatic, and this one, a manual, 1.8 litres, 24 valves, V6, and 135 brake horsepower, and it's going to cost around £15,000. Could it be, I wonder, that the cult of the hot hatchback is finally start going to give way to more and more pretty coupes, even if, like this one, there's only room for squash sardines in the back? That sort of practical consideration never much bothered the Italians. But this Alfa Proteo concept coupe at least proves they haven't lost the art of making beautiful cars. It's a two-seater based on the Alfa 164, but with four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering and an active suspension system. The engine is a 24-valve 3-litre, giving it a top speed over 150 miles an hour. Some of the body panels are carbon fibre, and it changes from a closed coupe to an open convertible. If it ever goes into production, I predict a long queue of buyers. This is the vehicle which Vauxhall, that's Opel in Europe of course, intends to attack the recreational vehicle market. They've called it the Frontera to capture a suitably adventurous spirit, and it comes in two versions. This is a short wheelbase three-door version which has General Motors' own very efficient uh, two-litre engine. The longer wheelbase model, which is 18 inches longer, has both petrol and diesel options, and it's good to hear that both the petrol engines come as standard with catalytic converters. The drivetrain is from Isuzu, the allows for two-wheel and selectable four-wheel drive. Now, despite the distinctly uh, Midwestern styling, as opposed to gentlemen up in the country, the good news is that both these vehicles will be built at Luton. And rumour has it the pricing will be very competitive indeed to slice their way into the market. But it's a market sector, of course, already knee-deep in competitors, not least amongst them being Mitsubishi, with a vastly improved range of Shogun models, uh, called the Pajero, of course, elsewhere in Europe. Substantially redesigned, both the five-door and the three-door versions, rounded and softened to eliminate a great deal of intrusive wind noise. But more importantly, there's a host of engineering improvements. For example, they've totally redesigned the drivetrain. So now you can go from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive at 60 miles an hour, without there being a great clash of steel. Only when you're in deep trouble and need to lock everything up, you have to slow down to a crawl. There's also a, a multi-mode anti-lock braking system that automatically selects the appropriate braking arrangements for whatever mode you're driving in. So a package of improvements that makes the already competitive Shogun an even tougher challenge for the high-flying Discovery. But what about the luxury four-wheel drive market? Genuine Range Rover country, you might say. Well, of course, Range Rover has been top of the heap ever since it came out 21 years ago. Nothing else has quite matched its combination of class and toughness. But now the improved Land Cruiser and G-Wagon are having another go, and Jeremy has been casting his super-critical eye over the battlefield. Now back here at the Motor Show, you don't get many new Bentleys to the decade, so this is a somewhat uh, privileged event, the launch of the new Bentley Continental Coupe for the 1990s. Let me get the figures out of the way straight away. It's slightly longer, slightly lower than the Turbo R. It weighs two and a half tons, and the muscular 6.75 litre engine can get this monster up to 60 in 6.6 .6 seconds. Oh yes, and they're claiming it's a full four-seater. Now the design brief was for a sculpted look, and the result of these go faster bulges, if you like, that run right down the side panels of the car, flaring out of the rear wings, ending up in these gouges cut out of the top of the boot. Have they improved the appearance? Well, I think the jury is still out on that. Now, inside, apart from the inevitable hand-picked hide and polished walnut, the big change is the central console, which runs from the fascia right the way through the rear seats. Price tag £160,000, complete with number plates, of course, but the bad news is it's a limited edition. Only 300 planned for 1992, so don't delay while stocks last. Now over to Sue, who's next door on the Jaguar stand. I rate this one of the best looking cars in the show, and it's 30 years old. Jaguar's E-Type was launched at the Geneva Motor Show in 1961. Priced £2,200, although they charged you £60 extra for the wire wheels. It caused a sensation then, and it's still been attracting crowds today. And by modern standards, its performance is respectable. A 3.8-litre six-cylinder engine gives it a top speed of 150 miles an hour, and it'll do 0 to 60 in seven seconds. Now, I wonder how many of today's new cars are going to age as well as this one. Well, that's about it for this week. If we've whetted your appetite, we will be having later in the series full road test reports on the Citroen, the Shogun, the BMW 3 Series, and that marvellous new Mercedes S-Class. Now, next week, we have a report on the historic 
RAC rally from the west with uh, my mate Tony Mason joining his old mate Roger Clark in car number one. We have a road test on the Proton from Malaysia, which has recently received the Watt Car Best Value Award, and we look at the value of company cars. Until then, it's goodbye from Sue and myself in Geneva. Cheerio.